part one of the Battle of Russia, you saw the Russian people's historic defense of their land against centuries of unsuccessful invaders. You also saw how after five and a half months of Nazi blitz, the Russians stopped Hitler at the very gates of Moscow, and how, in spite of Hitler's prediction that by December of 1941, the swastika would fly over the Kremlin towers. December had come, but it wasn't the swastika that flew over the Russian capital, and it wasn't the Nazi conquerors who marched through the streets of the ancient city, but fresh reserves of the Red Army on their way to reinforce and relieve the front lines. Russians read this appeal and knew what it meant. They remembered that in their past history, the time always came when they could turn and strike back. The time had come. Their old ally, the Russian winter, had carpeted the Russian land. And while in the churches of Russia, men of God prayed for victory against the invaders. lines, the men of the Red Army listen to the long-awaited order of the day. The whole world is looking to you to destroy the German hordes. The war you are fighting is a war of liberation, a just war. Death to the German invaders. Fighter command ready. Bomber command ready. Parachutists ready. Artillery in position. Tanks manned. Cavalry in position. Infantry ready. Beyond those hills is the enemy. It was the Germans' turn to fight for their lives. Now, for the first time, it was the German army that retreated. Now, it was for the Germans to learn the terrors of scraping.
village after village, town after town. On the Red Army swept through the country which for days and weeks had been under the invaders' yoke. out of the forest, out of only they know what hiding places, come the men and the women and the children that had once called these towns home. Soldiers and guerrillas find wives and mothers. Friends are reunited. There is thanksgiving in their streets, thanksgiving in their hearts. But there is also something else, something they will never forget, their ruined homes. The shattered towns they once had known as thriving and prosperous communities. They stand gutted now, ghostly relics of what they once had been. Nothing has been spared. This was a museum, the former home of Peter Tchaikovsky, a man who wrote music for Russia. Music that sought the heart of his own people because it found that heart, it found the hearts of people everywhere. This piano concerto. The Fifth Symphony. The Sixth Symphony. work was, is, and always will be, inspiration to countless millions. But it brought only one inspiration to the Nazis, vandalism. And this is the home of Leo Tolstoy, the author of the immortal novel, War and Peace. His home, too, was a museum, until the Germans came. And this is Tolstoy's grave. If the Nazis buried nearby had read his famous book, they would have learned their fate beforehand. But there were other dead the Nazis didn't bury. Russian dead. They weren't soldiers, and they weren't killed in battle.
No, these aren't dogs. These are children. Mass murder by orders of the high command. And there were other children. Perhaps more fortunate, perhaps less. Young girls, but not young now. The attentions of the Nazi soldiers aged them very quickly. And whoever resisted the invaders met with this. These are the things the Russians can never forget. These are the things the Russians will never forget. These are the reasons why every Russian pledged his life to uphold this sacred oath. Blood for blood, death for death. That is the reason the Russians smashed on, deeper and deeper, along the entire front from Rostov to Leningrad. Nowhere could the tide of Russian pressure be stopped. And by spring of 1942, this area was delivered from the Germans. But this was not the important result. Not that this town or that village was retaken, but that the whole legend of Nazi invincibility had been shattered. German armies could retreat too. German armies could be defeated. German troops could be captured. Besides this crushing offensive, there was another factor that shattered the legend of Nazi invincibility. That factor, which will live forever in the history of this war, was written by the people of this city. A city now called Leningrad after the leader of the Russian Revolution, Lenin, and which before that was called Petrograd in honor of its founder, Peter the Great. A city which today, with the exception of Moscow, is the most important center in the Soviet Union because some of Russia's largest industries are centered here and also because it is Russia's principal port on the Baltic Sea and the base for its Baltic fleet. Here, as throughout the Soviet Union, on June 22nd, word came of the attack. But here, the city was only a few miles from German lines. While the men of the Red Army and the Baltic fleet moved out to meet the enemy, behind them another army was formed. An army whose weapons were shoveled instead of rifles. An army of men, an army of women, an army of children. Feverishly, they dug the trenches, threw up barricades, built defenses, prepared themselves for the worst. They knew that they too were in the front line. They weren't wrong.
Leningrad's baptism of fire didn't stop with the darkness. <laughs> Finally, the morning comes, and the people of Leningrad dig themselves out from the ruins. very similar here to the people of London, of Rotterdam, of Warsaw. As in those cities, there were ruined homes, museums, and other important military objectives, like the Russian Dumbo from the Leningrad Zoo. But there was one important difference. Bombing from the air was only one small part of what the people of Leningrad had to face. In September, the Nazis surrounded the city and announced it was cut off and doomed. The German commander sent the city an ultimatum demanding its surrender. He is still waiting for the answer. Thus began the siege of Leningrad, a siege that was to last for nearly 17 months. In Leningrad, as everywhere else in Russia, the winter came early that year. A cold, hard winter, the hardest in years. But here, unlike everywhere else in Russia, the winter wasn't an ally but an enemy. Here, the 10, 20, 30 below zero temperatures could only mean more suffering, more hardship. In the trenches outside the city, trenches of snow and of ice, the defenders stuck firm to their oath, to die if necessary, but not to go backward one more step. And the enemy, in spite of all its efforts, was stopped at the very gate of the city. A city now facing disease, famine, destitution. There was no oil for fuel, no power for the electric line, but the people defied the elements and trudged the necessary miles to lathe and work then. The pipes froze, water was shut off, so they dug holes through the streets until they could get to water. There was no food, and the whole city went on starvation rations. A factory worker got eight ounces of bread a day. Everyone else, child and adult alike, only four. And to keep the dread enemy of disease from stalking the streets of their city, an army of women worked with shovels, worked with picks in those streets every day, clearing away the rubble, the wreck, sources of contamination. Bombs from the air couldn't force the defenders of Leningrad to surrender. Winter couldn't do it. Hunger couldn't do it. So the Germans decided to shell them into surrender. For days, long-range guns hurled ton after ton of high explosives into the heart of the city. Leningrad were shelled, the harder they worked. Drenched 
crushed in a rain of high explosives, cut off entirely from the rest of Russia, with only their own hands to depend on. Their determination never faltered. Every day, more people die. Cold. Disease. Hunger. This was Leningrad in its darkest hour. And then a miracle happened. To the west of Leningrad is the Baltic Sea, and to the east and north is Lake Ladoga, 7,000 square miles of inland water. The Finns and the Germans occupied one border of the lake to about this point. And in the south, the Germans controlled the lake to here. Between these two points was a stretch of lakefront still in Russian hands. But there was nearly 100 miles between this shore and the beleaguered city. A hundred miles of what had been open water and was now snow-covered ice. Across this frozen surface now went tractors, sledges, carving a road across the lake. Soon across this highway, from the far side of the lake, poured a stream of trucks, bringing in food, oil, grain, fuel, truckload after truckload of fresh light for the people of the city. Too late, the Germans discovered that they had left one avenue of rescue open. by night. And soon more than trucks would reach the city, for the Russians were now laying a track across the ice. To the heroes of Leningrad, says the inscription on this locomotive as it starts its pioneer voyage. From the far shore of the lake, it brings food, medicine, supplies of all kinds across the lake and into Leningrad. This train is but the first of many. Trains that not only brought in supplies, but that could take out the wounded, the sick women, the half-frozen children. All those that needed better care. All winter long, the lake traffic continued. And all through that terrible winter, the men of the Red Army, outside the city, found the strength not only to defend, but to attack. Time after time, they hurled themselves against the invader, driving him inch by inch back from the city's outskirts. And then spring came. Spring. Outside Leningrad, the snows begin to thaw, and German bodies are washed from their icebox graves. Mute evidence of Russian tenacity. The warm breath of spring is felt, too, on the frozen surface of Lake Ladoga. But the trucks continue to roll, even though the ice is melting beneath them. as it invariably does, comes to the city, too. But spring is more than a new season for the people of Leningrad. It's a new life. The city begins to breathe again. For the first time in months, the trolleys ran. That first day, it seemed that every man and woman and child in the city had to go for a ride. 
This was life again. Life for the Leningrad children that weren't killed by Nazi bombs or by the horrible winter. Life for the Russian wax, the women of the Red Army. And for the Russian wave, the women of the Red Fleet. And for the sailors of the fleet themselves, the artists of the famous ballet theater have come to offer entertainment. <laughs> is here. Summer is coming. And Leningrad is still free. Although some Germans did finally succeed in getting into the city. But under different circumstances than they had anticipated. Yes, here too the legend of Nazi invincibility was shattered against the iron will and courage of a determined people. The citizens of Leningrad have proved that generals may win campaigns, but people win wars. By summer of 1942, new posters were appearing in the streets of Moscow. Posters that greeted and welcomed their allies. Allies whose help was already arriving in Russian ports. Allies whose friendliness had sent drugs and food and warm clothing to help sustain them in their darkest hour. But in spite of all this, the staff of the Red Army knew that they still faced the most powerful enemy in history and that that enemy would attack again. But when this attack came, the whole German strength was to be concentrated on one objective, the Caucasus and oil. The Caucasus Mountains represent one of the toughest military obstacles in the world. Towering peaks rising to heights of as much as 18,000 feet, with only one practical highway traversing them. And Baku, the biggest oil field, is on the other side. To reach Baku, the only feasible military route was along the coast to the Caspian Sea. But the map shows what a dangerously extended supply line this would entail. To make the operation a success for the Germans, the first necessity was control of the northern hub of the rail lines of the area and a new base of operation. That hub was a Volga River port we have come to know well, Stalingrad, named for Russia's present leader. The pride of this generation of Russians, for it was their city, built in their time. The capture of Stalingrad, the Nazis would have a base from which to launch a flanking attack on Moscow. With one master stroke, the Russian armies to the south would be cut off from help. And in the north, Russian factories, Russian farms, and Russian armies would be practically cut off from Caucasus oil, and also from American and British supplies, which were shipped to Russia through Iran and Iraq. German control of the entrance to the Volga and its two main ports Aspartan and Stalingrad would be a crippling blow for Russia. For the Volga is the vital artery through which flowed the lifeblood of supply. Early in May, the German offensive began along the front extending from Kursk to the Crimea. Within two weeks, the Nazi steamroller had overrun the Kerch Peninsula, although two months more were to elapse before embattled Sevastopol finally fell giving the Nazis complete control of the Crimea and the southern route to the Caucasian oil field. Next, they started to drive further north and drove through to the Don River in the area of Varana, then spread south and east until they occupied the whole area from the Don River south to Rostov. This left them in perfect position to strike against Stalingrad. Further and further south, the drive plunged on, and by the end of August, they had captured the oil fields at Maycock, needless to say, first demolished by the Russians, and reached the northern Caucasus. Yes, the Germans were only a few miles from their goal, the oil fields at Baku. But two barriers still stood between them. 
Russian mountains and Russian determination. The people of the Caucasus joined with the army to form an unshatterable wall against the full onslaught of the attack. Further north, the Nazi pincers were within 15 miles of Stalingrad. This city had become the focal point of the whole campaign. Regardless of the cost, Stalingrad must be captured. Those were the German orders. Fire! Fire! German guns, German bombs shattered the city into pieces. September 20th, the Germans, after 30 days of grueling and ceaseless fighting, battled their way into the city's outskirts. By the end of the month, their driver carried them through the whole northwest section of the city and into occupation of part of the center, including the railroad station. On the last day of September, Hitler announced that the fall of the city was only a matter of a few days. Once more, the world was afraid a Russian campaign was lost. But once more, the Germans were to stand on the very threshold of victory and still fail. But now they were to meet a fire of fury such as they had never known. waged in the streets of Kiev, Rostov, Odessa, Sevastopol. These were all preludes to what happened in Stalingrad. Every inch of the city was a strategic point to be defended as such. At the end of October, snow covered Stalingrad. From the air, the Germans tried to force the surrender of the Russian-held part of the city. At the same time, the battle of the streets continued. were no longer defending their city inch by inch. Inch by inch, they were regaining it.
of the whole world spoke in admiration of the city of steel. The ticker tape brought us breathtaking news. American and British troops had landed in and occupied North Africa. Further east, the British Eighth Army was driving westward, pursuing the vaunted Africa Corps. And in the northeast, the Red Army had launched its smashing counteroffensive. The Germans were learning the real meaning of the word combined operation. As though a spring had been released, the Russians attacked along the entire front. In the far north, the Germans felt the first impact. The Russians recaptured Schlüsselburg, breaking the Axis ring around Leningrad. Soon after, another offensive lashed out further south, bypassing the Germans' defense position of reserve and plunging down to Veliki Lukin. Still another Russian blow fell in the Voronezh area, pushing a threatening spearhead deep into the German line. In the far south, the Germans were moving away from Drost instead of toward it under the force of the Russian attack. At Stalingrad, the Germans were about to meet new opponents. Fresh reserves were arriving from far Siberia. They had been stationed there in case of trouble with the Japanese. Now these troops had been transported to relieve the embattled defenders of Stalingrad. And as the reserves entered the city, at headquarters, the commanders of three Russian armies were meeting. The Germans had fought for Stalingrad as a prize. The Russians were determined to make it a trap. Two simultaneous attacks were launched, one from the north, one from the south. The German armies encircling Stalingrad were now themselves threatened with encirclement. Finally, the two prongs met. These battle-hardened soldiers of the Northern Army and soldiers of the Southern were emotional as children as they greeted each other. They knew this meeting meant the salvation of Stalingrad and of their country. And on this Christmas of 1942, the people of the Soviet Union can celebrate with happy hearts. They have received a most precious gift from the men of their army, the assurance of ultimate victory. Just as in our hometown, it is the Children's Day in Moscow. It is a happier Christmas this year. Today, there are no German bombers overhead. celebrated on New Year's Eve, but not now. The factories are just as busy as on any other night. The moment comes. It is the New Year. Sovereign Gordon! And at the front, the greeting is the same, up to a point. Sovereign Gordon, Gvergeitsi! Agon! Stalingrad, the icy winter becomes a fiery hell. Here are concentrated the latest in Russian equipment. Flamethrowers. Ice gliders. Used here by shock troops to capture airfields in advance of the main army. Rocket guns. Katusha, the Russians call them.
Every last resource of the Red Army was thrown into a crushing offense of ultimate destruction. On February the 2nd, 1943, after 162 days of the heaviest fighting in the history of warfare, the last shot was fired. The peace came to some grass. In the shattered streets, the blasted ruins, the ghastly evidence of their ordeal, the defenders of the city greet the rescuing army of the dawn. Stalingrad is free. The Nazis have capitulated. The German generals who had been ordered by Hitler to take Stalingrad regardless of the cost, and who had obediently promised that the city would be his, these generals, 24 of them, who had covered themselves with such glory and such metal on the fields of Poland and Norway and France, they now had only their past glory to comfort. This is Field Marshal von Powell, Commander-in-Chief of the German Army at Stalingrad. This is the man who told his soldiers that if they surrendered, he would see to it that their families died in reprisal. When he faced his captors, perhaps his worried expression reflected an anxiety that Hitler might take the same revenge on his family. For he knew that when he surrendered, Hitler lost not only a field march, he lost an entire army, 22 divisions, 330,000 men. These are the men who had been promised that as conquerors they would winter in Stalingrad. Well, it was winter, and this was Stalingrad. Here were the conquerors. When another spring broke over the Russian countryside, the results of the winter were clear. The invader had been driven back far beyond the lines he had occupied a year early. 185,000 square miles of Russian land had been freed. And in this winter campaign of 1942, the Axis powers had lost 5,090 planes, 9,190 tanks, 20,360 guns, 30,705 machine guns, more than 500,000 rifles, 17 million shells, 128 million cartridges, vast stores of other materials, and 1,193,525 men, of whom 800,000 were dead. That is the story to date of the German attempt to conquer Russia. In 1941, they tried for Moscow and failed. In 1942, they tried for the Caucasus and failed. In 1943, and for as many more years as necessary, they will not only be resisted wherever their failing power strikes, but they will be attacked, attacked, and attacked by these united people of these united nations.